Um, the next speaker is uh, is Elena Del Valle, uh, who is going to speak about engineering single and n photon emission from frequency resolved uh, correlations. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. Okay, so I will uh, remain in the topic of light, uh, but I will be speaking about quantum light generation. So generation of single and n-photon uh, states from, well, from a perspective of theory and uh, starting from frequency resolved correlations. And okay, um, these are basically results that uh, we got in the group working both at the University of Autonomy of Madrid and the University of Wolver Wolverhampton. So let me first introduce very briefly, oops, how can I go there? Yeah. So let me show you my group right now. Uh, there is uh, Eduardo Zuizarreta, who is a PhD student and al already gave a talk yesterday, so you know him. Uh, there is uh, Camilo, who already read the thesis, presented his thesis more than a year ago, but is working as a lecturer at the University of Wolverhampton. And Professor Fabrice Lossi, who actually uh, recently started a whole new physics department there at the University of Wolverhampton, where we are, uh, we've been helping him. And is there, yeah, he's a full professor there. Okay, so let's start. Let me show you first the outline of the talk, what I will be speaking about. I will, I will be um, discussing n photon emitters and single photon emission uh, in the case of resonance fluorescence, so a two-level system driven by a laser in a dissipative system. And I will be doing that from the starting from the perspective of frequency results, frequency and time results correlations. Okay, so the standard thing usually uh, correlations are computed or, or measured resulting time, and I will be introducing a new variable frequency, and you will see that brings a lot. This brings a lot of interesting things features, right? Okay, so let me start by introducing this this tool, this frequency and time resolved correlations from the theory and a bit experimental point of view. And well, yeah, you see here a couple of images that I will show later what they mean, why I put these frogs and this orange. <laughs> this will be a mystery for the end. <laughs> okay, so let's start. Okay, so frequency resolved correlations come from putting together two very typical very standard measurements or yeah, quantities, magnitudes that are used in quantum optics, yeah? So the first one is the most standard thing. The first thing you measure in the lab is the photon spectrum, the photoluminescence spectrum, or one photon spectrum, one photon em yeah, emission. And let me, well, here I put a, the example I will use actually, which is very simple. It's just a two-level system that emits photons when it's excited. You can excite it coherently, incoherently, and at the end of the day, it will emit photons with a given rate, gamma. This will be measured by a, by a counter, by, by a detector. And then you can count the photons that arrive at a given frequency, right? You resolve these photons in frequency in this uh, photoluminescence spectrum. And you can, well, in, from the theory point of view, you can compute this by describing your system with open quantum, yeah, quantum systems. You can do master equation or, or simulations with Monte Carlo, quantum Monte Carlo, and compute the density matrix. And then with the density matrix, you use the quantum regression theorem. I'm not putting here all the math, right? I'm just putting the very simple expression. But uh, finally, at the, end of, at the end of the day, you describe your open system uh, with a density matrix. And then using the quantum regression theorem, you compute the two-time correlator. I will show a bit more on that later. And then the Fourier transform, you get the spectrum of emission. OK, just very briefly. At the end of the, of the day, what you're doing is just looking at how many photons arrive at the detector at a given frequency. And because you have a measurement here in your, uh, I mean, a detector that is not perfect, of course, there is some frequency detector resolution that I will call big gamma. And this will be important for the rest of the, of the presentation. This is the filtering window, let's say. Okay, so we put together this with another very standard measurement, although not so easy to, to obtain, which is the second order coherence function or two photon correlations, which actually usually are not, uh, are not resolved in frequency, but in time. And this speaks more about the relationship uh, between the photons, right? So you now split your signal in what is called a Hambury Brown and Twist setup. You split it with a beam splitter, and now you look at coincidences in the two in the two detectors. And basically, you're answering the question: What is the probability to emit or to detect two photons delayed by a given time tau? And again, you can compute this using uh, standard uh, tools like the uh, 
the master equation and regression theorem and so on, and you compute this correlator here. This is the big, well, the numerator, you normalize it, and you obtain what Glauber introduced actually, as I'm going to show here, this is Glauber, right? He won the Nobel Prize because of these things. Second order cohesion function is a very important, very important uh, tool in quantum optics. Let me briefly show you what it means, especially at zero delay, when you have, especially, yeah, uh, you have to have, let's say the conditions would be that you have a uh, continuous driving, so that at the end of the day, if you look at a delay with a very long tau, very long tau, you would get one. Uh, let's say no correlations, right, between the photons. If you if you wait long enough, the, the photons are not correlated when you look at them. But if you look at zero delay, that is coincidences, really, you really count in your detector the coincidences arriving at the two detectors. Then this has a very uh, very important, very meaningful. Um, this is a very meaningful magnitude. What do we get? Well, uh, if you get a zero or at least below one, then what you have is that photons are arriving in a separate, let's say, way, right, one by one. This is called anti -bunching. And this is typically the case of, a, of the mission of a two-level system because you need some reloading time to emit the next photon, right? So the photons are arriving uh, separated in time. So then this will be blue in my presentation. I will show some pictures later and this the color code will be blue for the anti -bunching. And this is the most quantum emission you can get, right? There are no, there's no classical analog for this G2 equal or below one, equal to zero or below one. Then if you have G2 equal one, that means that you have photons that are completely correlate, uncorrelated, sorry, like that of a laser. And if it's above, then you have uh, some, well, uh, bunching, it's called, right? It's when photons are starting to arrive in groups. Typically, for instance, you have the value of G2 equal to, which is thermal light, like the sun or above, or even it can be much larger than one. Then it could be that you are having really arriving, uh, photons arriving in groups of N or in just random groups, but bunched, okay? Okay, this color code, as I say, will be important. The red will be bunching, uh, white uncorrelated, and blue anti bunching Okay, so we put these two things together. I didn't yet, so let's now put them together. By basically experimentally, this means that instead of just using standard detectors, you put some filters in front of them so that you can select two different frequencies when looking at the coincidences. And uh, this means that you are basically opening two frequency windows, right? You, if you have a spectrum, which is just a Lorentzian line, I don't know, a spectrum of emission, you are selecting these two windows to look at correlations also resolved in time. So now you have frequency and time. And you are looking at these two properties, right? That, that basically you are seeing the question, what is the probability to detect two photons that are delayed by a given tau, or at the same time, if the tau is zero, that are, uh, that, that are emitted at two different frequency, frequencies, omega one and omega two. Okay. Now, here we have to be careful as well with the, um, in the case of uh, in the case of of the second order coherent function, now the precision in the measurement will be uh, in time, and this is in this case it comes as the inverse of this gamma that we had before in the frequency because of the Heisenberg uncertainty relationship between the two magnitudes, frequency and time. So you have that this gamma represents the precision in the measurement of frequency and the inverse the precision in the measurement of time, right? Because you are measure, measuring them at the same time. Therefore, both of them will not be, it will not be possible to know them precisely at the same time, right? There will be high symbol uncertainty between them. Okay, and now what about, um, what about, well, what are these, uh, these frequency correlations, frequency and time resolve correlations used in the, I don't know, in the literature? And yes, they are, they've been used experimentally because experimental is kind of simple. You can just put these two filters and, and compute them, right, and measure them. So experimentally, they've been used a lot, for instance, to see what are the correlations between two separated peaks, if, if there's some relationship between, between two emissions that appear in the spectrum. For instance, when they were trying to show uh, in 2007, uh, if there was a strong coupling between a, a, a quantum dot um, line, a quantum dot emission, and the cavity where it was placed, they were trying to see if there was a strong coupling. So they were looking at frequency resolve correlations to see if something different from one was happening there. Therefore, they would be coupled, right? So this is kind of standard or it's been done a lot in experimentally. From the theory point of view, it, also since the 80s, the people were wondering how to compute these functions and actually they got a full theory about it then. And the answer, it's not very nice. <laughs> it's uh, basically what you need to do in order to get them, these, I'm going to call them uh, well, S1 would be the spectrum of emission that I just showed before. This would be to normalize. 
And the numerator is the S2. This is the, the, the actual second order coherent function resulting both time and frequency. To compute, to compute them, you actually have to do some convolution with the detectors. I mean, this is a, also the input output, let's say formalism as applied as such. And then you would have to put the, in this case, the temporal response function, which are just exponentials, because we are considering filtering with just Lorentz and profiles. And then the Fourier transform is just an exponential, a decaying exponential. Here you see appearing this gamma, the precision in the measurement. So you have to do the convolution. The, usually in a spectrum of emission, you would just do the Fourier transform of the two time correlator. Okay, this is kind of well known in, in, in optics, in quantum optics, uh, computing this two time correlator. But now you have a four time correlator and you have to do, well, more, um, more Fourier transforms. And also you have to add these four. Uh, for response functions. What does this mean in, in terms practically, right? It means that you have to do a lot of uh, efforts <laughs> to compute these functions because you, uh, basically this four time operator is different depending on the, on the order between these times. And then when you do the integrals, you have many different orders. So you have to recompute this co four time correlator, which means using the quantum regression theorem many times. Well, you have to make a big effort and numerically this may be unstable as well. And it's also very difficult to generalize to n photons. So this is only for two, two photon correlations. But if you want to have three, four, then it's, it's kind of complicated to compute. So in, back in 2012, we came up with a theory to do this in an easy way, let's say. And our idea was to actually, instead of trying constantly to uh, trying to compute these correlation functions in terms of the system operators, to include the detectors as part of the system. So you have a system that is emitting, and here you have the detectors. We model the detectors as two-level systems, for instance. It could also be harmonic oscillators because they are not really populated. They're in the weak coupling. Well, they are not uh, getting a lot of photons, let's say. So you can use any mode, really. You model them. You put the frequencies that, that you want to resolve. You put the gammas that you want them to have as precision in the measurement. And then you couple them very quickly in a way that is uni, well, it's unidirectional, basically. You can use just a regular coupling, like the usual coupling we use a Hamiltonian coupling, or you can also use um, directional coupling, right? You can use a cascaded formalism, it's called. In any case, at the end of the day, what you do is compute directly just simple correlation functions between the intensities in these in this detectors, right? That is written here. So you don't have to make any integral. Directly, you get these, these correlation functions for any number of, of detectors. You have to be careful that this, this is really weakly coupling, a weak coupling, that it's uh, one directional. But other than that, it's very simple, general, and scalable method. And actually, yeah, you can use it in any situation. Tempor um, I mean, uh, something that is pumped uh, con constantly or, or Elena, not, or with a pulse, anything. Um, and I also, sorry. Hi, Elena. So yeah. um, just a quick question. So usually yes. when you're looking at standard sort of quantum optics textbook G2s, you're always looking at a single frequency. I presume there are inside this queue, the box here, there are some processes that are giving rise to photons some correlated photon emission with one with frequency omega one and one with omega. So what sort of systems do you have in mind where this can be useful just so that uh, you can have an idea? I will, the... yeah, sure, sure, thank you. I will, right now, I will I will uh, finish with this general kind of theory and I will go into an example, very particular example of a two-level system. So you will see, I mean, it can be oh. any system at all, any quantum open system, I basically. Uh, but I will show you with an example and it's a very simple one, so it will be very clear, I think. So there is no need for a coherent process where you actually have like an omega one photon and omega two photon to go out is what you're saying. Uh, no, a... It can be any system. The system will be emitting at all omega, let's say, not okay. particularly at any, but then you can resolve at the ones you want. Maybe you want to resolve the peaks in the spectrum, of course, because there are many peaks. Maybe you want to resolve <coughs> those peaks typically, but you okay. can look at any point. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. I'll continue then. So yeah, so here also it's important that there is a Heisenberg uncertainty principle is, is kind of built in, right? Uh, it will be, um, I mean, uh, it's a consequence of the model. Also uh, in this, well, in this paper, we were showing in the supplementary material, the proof that this is exactly the same as the result of the integrals. Um, by doing that, we were also getting kind of a semi-analytical formulas and uh, well, and also a perturbation theory there. So a lot of interesting stuff came up uh, during this, while we were trying to prove that this is true, right? That this method was given exactly those, those functions as defined by the integrals. Okay, so now let's go to the example, yeah? So let's put something in this black box. Uh, 
uh, let's start. I, I'm, I'm going to refer always to resonance fluorescence, meaning when you have a two-level system that is excited by a laser resonantly and constantly, okay? So it's not a pulse, it's just constant driving at a given frequency of the laser. And then, well, the light that comes out, it's kind of very famous since uh, ages. <laughs> it's um, typically when you are driving it strongly, let's start with a strong, a strong driving, you get what is called a molo triplet. I'm showing here a few examples for the atoms, for the molecules, for the quantum dot. Well, in many systems, in many platforms, they already observed because it's not trivial, but they already did observe these molo triplets. Actually, where do they come from these three peaks? Because uh, you would expect one peak, right? Because you have a two-level system, so you just have one frequency in principle. But the thing is that when you are driving with a strong laser, you are addressing your two levels. You are making them uh, interact strongly with the light mode of the laser. And then you can see here in this inset, what you get is uh, dress modes, right? You have a, a splitting between two modes that are kind of polaritons, right? Like in the previous uh, talk. You have two modes that are mixed between light and matter. And then if you look carefully at, at the transitions between these modes, you realize that you can have three possible energies now. Instead of just one, instead of just one Lorentzian, you get three Lorentzians. And this is already very interesting. You, you can play with that, right? This molo triplet. So let's, let's do that. What do we do now with this molo triplet? Okay, so let's not look just at the spectrum of emission, but at the two photon correlations resolved in frequency now. Because of course, if you don't resolve in frequency and take the whole emission, what you get is just zero, because it's still a two-level system. So it cannot emit photons more than one by one. So you would get a zero anti -bunching. But if we resolve in frequency, that is now we plot it for the first photon, for the second photon, we have a 2D plot. What happens with the same color code I was showing before, is that you get a huge, <laughs> I mean, change, right? You get you get a, a very uh, nice landscape of colors. Here you can see areas of anti vanching of or uncorrelated photons in white, and uh, very in, very strikingly, you get three lines here in the anti diagonal which are red, which means that they are bands. So photons are arriving together, let's say in groups somehow. Okay, what do they mean? How how do we get this? Uh, anti how do we explain these anti diagonal lines? Well. The thing is that what you get there is, the, uh, is that at those lines, you have energy conservation between two photon transitions, for two photon transitions. So from these dress states that I was saying before, you don't go to the next manifold or the next rung of, of these dress states, but to the one below. So you are emitting kind of two photons at the same time, somehow virtually, because this, uh, this happens in the detector. I mean, if you don't look, if you don't look in frequency, again, you don't see all these processes. You have to kind of um, look what happens in the detectors. Uh, or resulting in frequency, right? So uh, you would get what we call the leapfrog processes. Here is uh, one of the explanations for the pictures of before. <laughs> we call them leapfrogs because you are jumping over a set of states, right? You are going from one manifold to two below. And again, you have a triplet for the same reason that you have a triplet in the spectrum, right? For this, just looking at how, uh, what are the what are these um, these energies, you get the three lines, the triplet. Okay, so now. Let me show you that this is not some craziness that we found, something crazy that doesn't go anywhere, that these nice uh, drawings, they actually exist. There was a group in Florida uh, a few years ago that measured them. So here I'm showing you um, the comparison between the theory and the experiment, right, in these papers. And you can see that it matches perfectly. So if you look, if you actually result in frequency, the emission of, uh, of resonance fluorescence, you get this very nice picture. And now what can we do with that? Because yeah, if you if it's something that you just, I mean, correlations that you measure, but you cannot use this light because they are virtual photons, for instance, these two photon emissions, how can we make them real and actually enhance them somehow so that we can use it as two photon, two photons, uh, two photon uh, states, right? The way to do that is actually to use parcel enhancement. That is to, to place our system, for instance, if it's a quantum dot in a, in a micro cavity, in a semiconductor cavity, or if it's an atom in an optical cavity, uh, to use a cavity. And then if this cavity has precisely uh, both photons, actually, yes, here we are at the diagonal. So both photons, I mean, all the photons in the cavity have a given frequency that falls on top of this red line, then we will have that this emission that is bands, that is virtual of two photons, will become real and actually parcel enhanced. So by putting in this system in a cavity, we actually get n photon states, or we call them n photon bundles. This is what we what we did in this paper with other co-authors. And uh, let me show you let me show you the uh, 
well, this is an artistic view, right? I, I spoke about two photon emission, but you can do exactly the same using four photon correlators and get four photon emission or n photon emission in general. So here I show also a new some views that was uh, discussing this possibility. Okay, uh, let me show you that a Monte Carlo simulation where you can see that this actually works. The Monte Carlo uh, was is shown here below. Here you can see different realization, different trajectories as a function of time. In blue, I'm putting whenever the system emits photons in pairs, in red when it's single photons, and in yellow no emission. And you can see that mainly, actually, if you look at the emission, it's in pairs. Here I'm putting an example with a micro pillar, for instance, uh, as in the talk of Jacqueline, right? Uh, this type of micro pillar where you place inside a quantum dot, you shine the laser, and then you emit uh, in the cavity mode as photons that are in pairs, right? And you can do that in threes, in, in fours, in whatever you want. Of course, this is not for free. I mean, you can, uh, it's not uh, that easy, uh, we wish. You need a strong coupling, right? That's the requirement. You need a strong coupling between the cavity mode and the quantum dot in the mode in that case. But actually for two photons, it's not, it's not uh, a very, let's say it doesn't have to be very, very strong, this coupling, right? Already with parameters that are very reasonable that any platform can achieve, you can get a quite high percentage of, of emission, what we call the purity, yeah, the percentage of n photon states as compared to the rest. Already you can get quite a lot. This is a function of the driving. And of course, if you have a very good system or very good strong coupling, like I don't know, semiconductor qubits or so, then you will see 100% emission in two photons. And even you can go with this kind of good strong coupling, you can start to see three photon, uh, emission of three photons and you could arrive to very good purities for three photons and even four, okay? Furthermore, very recently, we also published another paper with uh, Carlos Sánchez, Carlos Tejedor, and Alejandro, where we, Alejandro González Tuleda, where we uh, were showing- Excuse me, uh, yeah, uh, sorry to interrupt. Was there some sort of bistability there in those uh, plots of the uh, two photon emission probability? In photon emission probability? Yeah, you have some sort of bistability here or? Ah, no, no, no. Well, yeah. by stability, it's just that we plot it as a function of the power. And then until you don't, this power, so you start with very low power, right? And until you don't increase it enough to have the molo triplet, to split okay. the molo triplet into three peaks, you cannot do this kind of physics. So at some point, you start to have some purity, right? Okay. But it's just because we are I'm plotting here as a function of the driving. So it's not really by stability, it's just the way it's plotted. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so yeah, so I was saying that in this last paper, uh, what we did is to check that actually you can decrease, I mean, because yeah, you need very strong coupling, right? But if you actually further also filter the cavity, so if you have the cavity emission and you also filter the cavity uh, line so that it's very, uh, it's strictly the light coming from the cavity mode, then you can relax these conditions and you can have actually, this is shown in this plot, uh, you can with not so strong coupling, not such a strong coupling, you can get very high purity already, but just filtering the emission because you kind of purify it. You make it even more to photon light, okay? Okay, so this is about the um, strong driving. So now what happens, I'm going to show you another example of how to use these functions when we go to the low driving regime. So now I'm going to have, again, this two-level system, again, driven by a laser constantly, but very weakly. So a very faint laser. So, well, here I'm now writing the Hamiltonian, actually, the Hamiltonian for this two-level system, which is just this uh, spin operator um, driven by the laser and then the coupling to the laser. And this is the, the driving strength. So if we make it very small, actually we can solve, it's very nice because we can solve everything analytically to lead in order in this driving. So it's even more satisfying for a third, for a third edition, right? To get all these things uh, analytically. Okay, so let me show you what happens then first. Uh, from the spectrum point of view. Let's look first at the spectrum at the second order coherent function, and then we put them together again. So in the spectrum, if you load your, your driving laser, you go from the triplet that I was describing, describing before to just a single peak. But actually, this single peak is very particular because it takes uh, all the properties of the laser. Why is that? Because actually, this is what is called the Rayleigh scattering at this point in the high level regime, it's called this regime you get basically just scattered photons from the, from the laser. It, it, they are not really absorbed and emitted by the two-level system. So at the end of the day, what you get is the light of the laser scattered back. So the spectrum of emission actually is just a delta peak if you consider your laser to be perfect, let's say to be very thin, the negligible line width, which is usually what we do in theory, right? 
So it would be a delta topic. But we have to be careful because I said before that the, the, it's very important in this topic, the detection, the precision in the measurement. So if we have a given gamma, as I said before, when we are looking with a, de with a given detector, then the actual peak that we will measure will have that broadening, okay? It will be uh, broadened uh, by this big gamma, yeah? But if we actually want to say that our emitter is very thin, very monochromatic, which is very interesting to generate single photons that are, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a requirement. We want the photons to be uh, indistinguishable in, in frequency. So if the emission is very thin, we are having very equal, very similar photons, right? This is a very desirable condition. So in order to measure something that is really monochromatic, we need a very good detector. Therefore, we need that the, if we want it to be even subnatural line with this emitter that is below the natural uh, um, emission rate, we need this gamma of our detector to be very small, basically. So people, when they do this, uh, this experiment, they try to get the best possible detector in frequency so that they actually see a very, very thin peak that is below what is called subnatural line width, right? Below the natural emission rate. This is what, uh, what you would do to get a very monochromatic, monochromatic emitter. What happens from the point of view of the statistics from the second order cohesion function? If you look at it without frequency resolution, what happens? Well, you would get this famous anti-banching that I was telling you before, uh, which actually, in ideally, when with a perfect detector, goes to exactly zero at zero delay. And then, well, there is a little dip, uh, of course, uh, but I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's perfect, it's zero at zero time, at zero delay. Now, in this case, if we add detection, if we have some detection that the, um, a machine, a detector that is not perfect in time, that is not completely precise, then this dip will be also spoiled by this formula actually. So what you do if you want to have really a single photon emitter, that is that every time you get only one photon, you will need a very good detector in time. And that means a very large gamma in this case, right? Remember, it's the inverse. So you need a very large gamma, much larger than the natural uh, line width of the emitter. So actually, if you have the, other, the exact opposite type of detector, then you can get a very, very good single photon source in your two-level uh, system. But now, yeah, you would say, OK, you have the perfect emitter, right? You have a very monochromatic emitter with indistinguishable photons. And they are very perfectly anti bands emitted one by one. And this is what people were thinking. I mean, there are a lot of papers here that were saying, well, this is the perfect regime and the perfect emitter. It's also quite bright, actually, if you don't drive it, uh, I mean, if you drive it uh, not completely, I mean, super little. And at the end of the day, it has the two uh, qualities that you would like for a single photon emitter. But we have to be very careful because actually these two things are incompatible at the same time. That is, if you use the same detector for both properties, you will not see both things happening at the same time, right? Because of Heisenberg. So in one, you want it to be small, the gamma. In the other one, you want it to be large. So they are not compatible. At the end of the day, you will see a not very good <laughs> delta peak and a not very good uh, anti banching right? So this is what we are showing in, in this paper. But this is quite recent. We are showing with co-authors that actually if you increase, uh, well, if you decrease the gamma of your detector, you go from this perfect anti banching to something that is one you actually go to uncorrelated photons, right? This is what we are shown here, and among other things. So what can we do? I mean, how, how can we reconcile these two, these two properties? We want a single photon emitter that is very monochromatic. That would be great, so natural line width. So how can we do that? Well, first, and this is what I'm showing uh, now in this also recent paper, this, um, what we did a couple of years, or a couple of three years ago, is to solve this problem, to try to propose something that would fix this, this issue, right? And in order to do that, let me first explain to you what is the origin of anti and in the high regime, in the low driving regime. In order to do that, we are going to do something that is typical as well from, from theoreticians, which is to decompose our signal, our operator, or our emission, into two parts. One part that is the mean field, that is the full coherent part, let's say, if you do this correlator or this, or this uh, mean value, that would give you this alpha. And the other part is the quantum correlate, the quantum fluctuations, okay? Which has no mean, uh, but it has some statistics, okay? Okay, if we do that, we actually can uh, use this decomposition, this decomposition to, to see what happens in the G2, of the, G, the G2 of the total emission. Huh? I'm not doing frequency resolution. So here there is a, a decomposition that was used in homodyning experiments and so on some years ago by Fogel and Carmichael and other people from quantum optics.
you, what you can do is to actually separate your G2 into different components. The first component would be just what uh, comes from the laser, the laser, the Riley scattering I was speaking about. Yeah, this coherent part is basically giving you a statistics of one, as I said before, the G2 equal to one, and this comes from the laser. And this is always, not, never mind how much you drive your system, this is always one, and that's it. That comes from the laser. Now, there is another uh, term, this e, uh, I0, which is uh, what corresponds to exactly the fluctuations statistics. So what this, this D is doing. And if you look at the high driving regime, the model triplet regime of before, this is what dominates the, the system, what makes let's say uh, the only two terms that you have is this one of the laser and this I zero, when you sum them, because this one is negative, you get exactly the, the zero that you get from the anti vanching right? anti vanching the total G2 has to be zero. So summing these two things, you get a zero. So just the fluctuations are fully responsible for the anti vanching in that, in that regime, meaning that they are perfectly quantum, right? They are really uh, the, what, what is giving you the anti vanching However, if you lower, you see here something interesting happens when you lower the, the driving. You have an intermediate regime that I'm not going to discuss, but you get some anonymous mo um, moments. This is the I1. But more importantly for now, when you go to the low driving regime, the Heidler that we are discussing now, these fluctuations are actually become classical. Well, they, they become the, the I0 becomes one. So it's not responsible for the cancellation of the G2. What is responsible is this new term, the I2, which becomes minus two. So the three things together, they sum to zero. What, the, what is this, this term? This is the fluctuation quadrature squeezing, yeah? So basic, basically what is happening is that these fluctuations are no longer like quantum single photon type. They are squeezed, they are squeezed fluctuations. And they, they cancel, they, they get to cancel with the other two terms, the G2. Now what happens, let's look at the spectrum. I'm going back and forth between the two quantities that I explained before. Let's go to the spectrum. What happens in the spectrum with this decomposition that I just made? Well, on the one hand, you will have the delta that I was speaking about that comes precisely from this coherent part. But then you have another uh, term that is actually of a Lorentzian type. It's, it's no longer a delta. And this is the one that comes from the fluctuations, right? And this has the line width of the, of the two-level system. So the first one just gives you the Rayleigh scattering, the coherent photons. And no matter how thin is your detector or how thin is the window of, of, of your frequency window in your, in your detection, you always get it, right? You always get these photons. But what happens with these other ones, the squeezed incoherent emission that corresponds to actually two photon processes? Well, that when you start to filter, when you start to put a filter, which this is what we do in the frequency result correlations, you kind of let out this part of the tail. And at the end of the day, you are leaving out uh, part of the spectrum somehow. Therefore, what happens if we look at the decomposition of before as a function of this gamma, when we make it smaller, here is what we were before, right? We were compensating exactly the I0, oops, and the, and the one with the I2. Now, if we decrease, if we make it smaller and smaller our filter, we spoil it completely, this interference between these terms, yeah? The compensation is broken. So what we get is the one, the G2 becomes one, as I showed before in this period. So yeah, what, what happens? We, we, now we are fully filtering this, the coherent photons, but we are not filtering the squeezed photons and therefore there is no interference anymore. So what can we do? What we propose to do in this paper that I was saying before is to actually compensate that loss by removing coherent photons, yeah? Because you cannot put back the squeezed photons, those are lost and that's it but you could remove a little bit of, this in, of these coherent photons by just using another laser. So we use an external laser that is, uh, pay, um, is phase shifted with respect to the original one, or the, it has the phase that it needs so that it cancels some of these coherent emission. So what we do is remove, let's say what is needed so that the, the interference is restored, yeah? This is what we do. Here I'm showing kind of the setup that would do that. So you have a laser, you shine it to your sample, to your quantum dot, for instance, your two-level system. In principle, you would get this single photon, kind of. But if you now measure them with some line width, with some width of the frequency, yeah, then they are spoiled. It's not perfect single photon emission. But now we can mix the signal with another external laser that we, we shift it on, we attenuate it, we control it somehow. And now the mixed signal that comes out here will, hopefully, I will show you, will have uh, the properties restored. Okay, so basically uh, what I'm going to do now is to mix the signal that comes from the two level system excited by the laser with another laser, just an external laser. And let me show you what happens then. It's very interesting, very nice. 
First, let's look at the case of perfect time detection. So if you look without the laser, which is the case here uh, when you have uh, zero, this F is zero, yeah? In that case, we have perfect uh, anti -vancing. Here I'm showing G2, G3, G4, so all the correlation functions, they go to zero. So it's perfect single photo emission, as I said, because we are looking at the full emission, no problem. And even here, there are things uh, happening, interesting things happening. If we start to mix with a laser, even here in this case, we see a lot of resonances occurring. So we see that the population, the total population of the emission falls here at this value and the G2, G3, G4, they have some resonances. Let me show you what they mean. Okay, so the first one, the first resonance is the one I just said, where all the GNs go to zero. This is the perfect, normal, usual uh, anti vanching of the two level system. And this is called, we call it, uh, we, we have to put names now because we have many features here. We call it conventional anti vanching conventional statistics. And this would be the case without the laser, right? If you would just look at the emission, the total emission. This is um, this was already explained why it's just because of the of the photons uh, reloading time and so on. But now we have here that the G two, for instance, goes again to zero at some point at so, uh, when you mix it with a laser. And this is what we call unconventional. Is this requires the laser? It's not just something that comes from the structure of the system, but it requires the mixing with a laser. And in this case is when we have the same coherence fraction of before, but with a pay, uh, with a pi shift, okay? So it's kind of the similar physics, but only for the G2. You cannot have now the G3 and the G4 fall into zero at the same time as you did here. So this is a difference between conventional and unconventional statistics. In the conventional case, you can have everything perfectly anti -vance. In the unconventional case, this is an interference. So you only get it at the two photon level, for instance. Or if you look at G3, you can get it at the three photon, at the four photon, but never all together, right? It's not possible because it's an interference precisely for that measurement, for the G2. And actually, you can see here as well, uh, another nice uh, feature is the, the fall of the, of the population, of the mission, just the, the total emission of the system. And this is, if the mission goes to zero, the, the coherent functions that are actually normalized by it will go to infinity. And why is that? This is what we call unconventional bunching. Again, unconventional because you need the laser to mix the signal. There's no way that you can get bunching without mixing with a laser here, right? Because it's just a two-level system. But if you mix with a laser, at some point what you do is kill completely the coherent fraction and you get the statistics of the fluctuations, which is very interesting. I said before that the fluctuations are squeezed. They are also bunched. If you look at the G2, G3 and so on, it's bunched, it's, it's above one. Right, so you get a point where the signal is killed. You have perfect interference. You kill your signal because it's mainly coherent light at this regime. But uh, you are looking at the quantum fluctuations of the system, which are squeezed and are bunched. And this is very interesting. The only thing I'm not going to go into details. Just wanted to to mention the origin of this. Uh, you would say that you can use maybe this to end to do end photon emission, but it's complicated because it's kind of ca ca chaotic like squeeze uh, light. Well, it's uh, it's a bit more complicated than just end photon emission. But let me go back to what we are interested in here, which is single photon emission, right? I'm going to discuss single photon emission. What happens now if our detector is not perfect and we have it, we make our frequency window smaller. So remember, we are leaving out some of the tails of the Laurentian and we are spoiling the perfect anti -vancing. You can see here, if you look at the case without the external laser, the anti is spoiled, right? It goes to one even in this case. But what happens now when you start your laser? Uh, your external laser. At some point, you recover again the G2. Yeah, you have the features of before, but here near zero, you also have again another interference of the G2 because we are exactly compensating the loss of the tails with the loss of coherent photons by uh, interfering with the laser. So this is what we call conventional. Uh, this is we call we call it a, a still conventional anti because we are trying to emulate the conventional anti of before, but we actually have the laser. So it's kind of a trick, right? It's not perfect. It's not exactly conventional anymore. We are restoring the anti thanks to the laser. And you can say, okay, but then you don't get the G3, G4, and so on zero at the same time as before. Yeah, before they were all zero. And then, yeah, that's true. You have to find a region where the, the gamma is smaller than the original gamma so that you can say that it's monochromatic, so natural line width, and so on. But still, you cannot go very low with this gamma. You cannot make it very thin, your signal, because then the G3, G4 will be crazy, will be very big, and it's not really single photon emitter. So you have to be in a regime that I put here in red, where the G2, G3, G4, all the Gs, let's say, are good enough so that you have a very good single photon emitter, and at the same time, it's subnatural line width. 
And of course, the price to pay, there is always a price to pay, is that you lose signal because you are removing photons with the filtering and removing them with the laser as well, the cogent one. So there is a signal loss, but it's not, I mean, it's not terrible. And also you have a, a, a bonus is that you get a very long coherence time. There is a plateau that opens at that point in the G2 resulting time. So this is quite interesting. Okay, so that's about the single photonemitter. Single photonemitter that is monochromatic and that is um, some natural light width. Let me just very briefly uh, speak about this uh, generalization of these concepts that we've made in this couple of, of, of papers. One is kind of a review and the other one is more about original results. Eduardo Zuizabeta uh, discussed them yesterday already in his talk, so you can go back to his talk that will be recorded, I guess. <laughs> and here I'm just going to mention very briefly that it's very interesting. You can not just have a two-level system, you can have any system, like matter coupling, uh, James Cummings Hamiltonian, whatever, and use this kind of uh, homodyne tricks or just self-homodyne even. In the case, for instance, of uh, the James Cummings Hamiltonian, that is a quantum dot coupled to a cavity mode. There are a lot of experiments in the group of Jelena Bukovic where they use this trick, not even with an external laser. They use the fact that they have many parameters and when they drive coherently, they can play with these parameters so that the coherent signal itself of the sample can kind of uh, interfere with the fluctuations, yeah? And well, they can, they can interfere with itself, yeah? And at the end of the day, you can purify the fluctuations. For instance, they use them to see better the molo triplet, to see the quantum dot emission um, let's say more quantum because they remove the coherent part of the of the mission. So this is quite interesting, and also this uh, is related to the problem of unconventional photon blockade in polar in, in polaritons. Yeah, and just two seconds, I'm about to finish. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so yeah, so yeah, in, in, there are a lot of papers about this problem in, in macrogravity polaritons, and this is also related. You can also look at the statistics in those cases, in the James Cummings, in the microcavity polaritons. Here I'm, I'm putting a couple of examples, and you can identify conventional anti banching conventional banching and conventional features as well. And all this without even using an external laser, just by self homodyning, yeah? just by playing with the parameters in the system. Uh, here I'm showing just uh, something that uh, Eduardo also showed that you can use this demonstration, this mathematica to, to play with the parameters to try to optimize this, this, uh, these statistics. And that brings me to the conclusions, yeah? That I showed this uh, time and frequency filter correlations, uh, this very powerful tool, both theoretically and experimentally. And then I applied it to the case of resonant fluorescence, the simplest one you can, you can imagine, two-level system shined with a laser to create an n photonemeter when you place it in a cavity and some natural light with single photonemeter when you interfere the light uh, with that of a laser. And let me thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Elena, for the very nice talk. And uh, are there any questions? Uh, hi. Uh, so I have some uh, question related to the uh, theoretical formulation for the measurement. Uh, you're introducing this uh, detector two levels. Mm -hmm. So typically, uh, like uh, the standard way the Glauber had motivated it, like is based on the uh, photon counting, uh, this uh, using uh, uh, the photo emission electrons. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, typically, uh, like it looks like uh, the uh, way you capture the inherent statistics of the uh, 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 photon fields, uh, you, you don't like uh, worry about the back action of the detector onto the cavity. So it looks like in your case, like you are also having this back action. Uh, you can mean, you say like, uh, whether it's an advantage or like uh, uh, if you want to only get the inherent statistics of the uh, photon mode? Uh, okay, I see. Very good question. Yeah, this is this is what I was discussing here at the, at the beginning when I was speaking about the model, right? Yeah. So, yeah, that's what I was saying that you it's very important that you make sure that there is no back action. Yeah. In order to the model to be true, actually, because in a detector, you don't get... I mean, you don't get light in the system from the detector. That doesn't make sense, right? You need only yeah. directional. Then there are two ways to do that. You can put a normal Hamiltonian coupling and then make sure that the coupling is very weak, much weaker. These, these epsilons are much smaller than any parameter in the system. And you actually check that the system is not uh, changing its dynamic due to the presence of the detectors, yeah? You make it very, very weak coupling. And then because everything is in the system, the pumping, the decay, everything is happening in the system, this coupling, even though you write it as bidirectional, happens only in one sense. This is what we show in the proof. Yeah, we show that kind of uh, analytically very clearly. So if you make it very small, this coupling, it will be unidirectional naturally. Yeah, if you just take the limit, let's say because of the normalization as well, these epsilons disappear. You take the limit of epsilon zero, 
they disappear. So the, the whole computation shouldn't depend at all on these epsilons, these couplings. Another way to do that, where you don't even care about the epsilon because it's by default built in, this concept that is unidirectional, is if you use a Gardiner cascaded formalism. This is something that oh, is okay. start, okay. yeah, in quantum optics, not, well, not yeah, fully, yeah. not everybody knows it, but it's, you can find it in the textbooks. And yeah, there, that, there, there it's unidirectional. Yes, yes, yes. It's yes. Another Thank you. Yes. And if you use that, we also show, maybe not in these papers, because it was a bit later when we showed that, but you can see that it's exactly the same result, yeah? That you also get the integrals oh. and exactly the same as in this paper. So both, both mm -hmm. formalisms work as a unidirectional coupling. But yeah, this is very important, of course, so that it makes right. sense physically, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, thanks, thanks. Thank oh. you. Okay, so maybe one last question. We are running very late on time, so just a quick question, maybe. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so um, um, how the, the from the two photon process to putting it in a cavity and making it into an n photon process, I that went by a little bit, little bit fast. Is there like how how does that happen? What are you doing? It's just some kind of uh, James coming ladder inside the cavity, or what exactly happens? Why do you? Yes, exactly. When from the from the um, let's say from the experimental point of view, you actually place your system inside a cavity, right? And that's it. Okay. And then what happens theoretically is that you actually uh, add another mode, which is the cavity mode, uh -huh. yeah, a photonic mode. And then you couple it mm, with a normal Hamiltonian coupling, right? Okay. And, and this coupling, also you will have some dissipation of the cavity, some limb okay. terms that go for the dissipation and whatever. And, and then that's it. Basically, if you look now, now you don't look at the emission of the emitter, you look directly at the emission of the cavity. And in okay. the emission of the cavity, you see these virtual photons kind of becoming real into the cavity mode. Right. So the emission okay. of the cavity is the one that you look at now. But yeah, so you basically put some Hamiltonian coupling. Hamiltonian, I mean, in the James Cummings, James Cummings so type. Yeah. In some sense, if you take this smaller triplet and make the uh, laser mode quantized, in some sense, you basically get a, not a triplet, but you can also get other end photons. Is that what you're saying? That's, that's all. Yes, yes. But yes. the thing is that the laser, I mean, you leave, what we do is that you leave the laser, you leave it as a classical uh, uh, bumping yeah, term. It's not that you quantize the laser, but it's more that you put, you couple the two lever system to the to another cavity mode. Sure. So you leave your laser sure. there, you couple to a cavity mode, and the cavity mode is quantized, of course. And then when looking at properties of that cavity, you see that all these two photons emerge, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Elena, for the very nice talk and... Uh...